A Treatise of Human Nature by David Hume. Book Two of the Passions. Part Two of Love and Hatred. Section One of the Objects and Causes of Love and Hatred. It is altogether impossible to give any definition of the passions of love and hatred, and that because they produce merely a simple impression without any mixture or composition. It would be as unnecessary to attempt any description of them, drawn from their nature, origin, causes, and objects, and that both because these are the subjects of our present inquiry, and because these passions of themselves are sufficiently known from our common feeling and experience. This we have already observed concerning pride and humility, and here repeat in concerning love and hatred, and indeed there is so great a resemblance betwixt these two sets of passions that we shall be obliged to begin with a kind of abridgment of our reasonings concerning the former in order to explain the latter. As the immediate object of pride and humility is self or that identical person of whose thoughts, actions, and sensations we are intimately conscious, so the object of love and hatred is some other person, of whose thoughts, actions, and sensations we are not conscious. This is sufficiently evident from experience. Our love and hatred are always directed to some sensible being external to us. And when we talk of self-love, it is not in a proper sense, nor has the sensation it produces anything in common with that tender emotion which is excited by a friend or mistress. It is the same case with hatred. We may be mortified by our own faults and follies, but never feel any anger or hatred except from the injuries of others. But though the object of love and hatred be always some other person, it is plain that the object is not, properly speaking, the cause of these passions or alone sufficient to excite them. For since love and hatred are directly contrary to their sensation and have the same object in common, if that object were also their cause, it would produce these opposite passions in an equal degree, and as they must from the very first moment destroy each other, none of them would ever be able to make its appearance. There must, therefore, be some cause different from the object. If we consider the causes of love and hatred, we shall find they are very much diversified and have not many things in common. The virtue, knowledge, wit, good sense, good humor of any person produce love and esteem. As the opposite qualities, hatred and contempt, the same passions arise from bodily accomplishments, such as beauty, force, swiftness, dexterity, and from their contraries, as likewise from the external advantages and disadvantages of family possessions, clothes, nations, and climate. There is not one of these objects but what, by its different qualities, may produce love and esteem, or hatred and contempt. From the view of these causes we may derive a new distinction betwixt the quality that operates and the subject on which it is placed. A prince that is possessed of a stately palace commands the esteem of the people upon that account and that first by the beauty of the palace, and secondly by the relation of property which connects it with him. The removal of either of these destroys the passion, which evidently proves that the cause is a compounded one. It would be tedious to trace the passions of love and hatred through all the observations which we have formed concerning pride and humility, and which are equally applicable to both sets of passions. It will be sufficient to remark in general that the object of love and hatred is evidently some thinking person, and that the sensation of the former passion is always agreeable, and of the latter uneasy. We may also suppose, with some show of probability, that the cause of both these passions is always related to a thinking being, and that the cause of the former produce a separate pleasure, and of the latter a separate uneasiness. One of these suppositions, that the cause of love and hatred must be related to a person or thinking being in order to produce these passions is not only probable but too evident to be contested virtue and vice when considered in the abstract beauty and deformity when placed on inanimate objects poverty and riches 
when belonging to a third person, excite no degree of love or hatred, esteem or contempt towards those who have no relation to them. A person looking out a window sees me in the street and beyond me a beautiful palace, with which I have no concern. I believe none will pretend that this person will pay me the same respect as if I were owner of the palace. Tis not so evident at first sight that a relation of impressions is requisite to these passions, and that because in the transition the one impression is so much confounded with the other that they become in a manner undistinguishable. But as in pride and humility we have easily been able to make the separation and to prove that every cause of these passions produces a separate pain or pleasure. I might here observe the same method with the same success in examining particularly the several causes of love and hatred. But as I hasten to a full and decisive proof of these systems, I delay this examination for a moment, and in the meantime shall endeavor to convert to my present purpose all my reasonings concerning pride and humility by an argument that is founded on unquestionable experience. There are few persons that are satisfied with their own character or genius or fortune, who are not desirous of showing themselves to the world and of acquiring the love and approbation of mankind. Now it is evident that the very same qualities and circumstances which are the causes of pride or self-esteem are also the causes of vanity or the desire of reputation, and that we always put to view those particulars with which in ourselves we are best satisfied. But if love and esteem were not produced by the same qualities as pride, according as these qualities are related to ourselves or others, this method of proceeding would be very absurd, nor could men expect a correspondence in the sentiments of every other person with those themselves have entertained. It is true few can form exact systems of passions or make reflections on their general nature and resemblances, but without such a progress in philosophy, we are not subject to many mistakes in this particular, but are sufficiently guided by common experience, as well as by a kind of presentation, which tells us what will operate on others, by what we feel immediately in ourselves. Since then, the same qualities that produce pride or humility, cause love or hatred, all the arguments that have been employed to prove that the causes of the former passions excite a pain or pleasure independent of the passion will be applicable with equal evidence to the causes of the latter.